Thank you so much, Natasha. I probably don't need to be quite that loud. Oh, yes, that's... Now I'm too quiet. No, we'll see. Right. Thank you so much, everyone, for that wonderful um, welcome to country and, and, for, um, and for the welcome. That's it. So it's a bit mean to start off by abusing you at a festival like this, but that's what I've decided to do. I'm basically telling you, I'm sorry, but you're probably bad at thinking about probability. But you shouldn't feel too bad about that, because it turns out that almost everybody including many mathematicians, are pretty bad at thinking about probability. Um, hands up in the audience if you have heard of the Monty Hall problem. A few people, but not everyone. So the, the picture on the left here sort of alludes to this famous problem in probability, where it's based on a game show. And so the idea is a contestant will pick a door to stand in front of, what they're hoping for is that they pick the door that has a car behind it. So there's one door that has a, a fantastic prize. The other two doors have goats. I mean, I guess if you like goats, you could play the game differently, but we're assuming that you want the car. Anyway, you pick your door, and then Monty Hall comes up, and he opens one of the other doors, revealing a goat. And the question here is, you could stay where you are in front of the door you initially chose, or you're allowed to switch to the other door. And so this question was sort of, the scenario was posed, and the idea is, well, is it better to stay where you are? Is it better to switch? Or can it not possibly make any difference? Let's have a quick show of hands. Is it better to stay where you are? Is it better to switch? Can it not possibly make any difference? <laughs> ah. Okay, so, so the answer is, is actually you've got a two-thirds probability of winning the car by switching. I'm not going to explain why. Come and talk to me afterwards if you, if you want to find out why. But it's just an example of probability being really counterintuitive. Uh, another famous one is the birthday paradox. Um, and this one says basically, how many people would you need to have in a room together before it's more likely than not that you have two people who have a birthday on the same day? It doesn't have to be the same year, but just the, the same day. Hands up if you think it would probably need to be more than 100 people. Hands up if you think it would need to be more than 50 people. Hands up if you think it would need to be more than 30 people. Okay, well, some of you might have heard the answer before, but the answer is 23. This is sort of like, for a lot of people, this is sort of a bafflingly small answer. So these are kind of a couple of famous problems that sort of illustrate that our intuition about probability is sometimes not that spot on. But Importantly, I don't want you to go, go away from today thinking, okay, I thought I sucked at probability and Barbara's confirmed it for me. Uh, what I would like is to talk about some, I guess, thinking heuristics that most people tend to have that are actually wrong and see if we can correct them. And that hopefully you'll, you'll end this talk uh, immune to a few sort of common mistakes. All right. So the problem I want to start off talking about is the taxi cab problem. That's, I didn't think of it. Um, Amos Tursky and Daniel Kahneman came up with it back in the late 70s. So here's our scenario. So you uh, have been called to jury duty in a small town where there are two taxi companies, green taxis and blue cabs. No, green cabs and blue taxis. Uh, blue taxis uses blue cars. Green cabs uses green cars. Uh, there are more green cars on the road than blue cars. They have 85% of the market share. On a dark and stormy night, a taxi rams into another car and then drives off. Terrible. Uh, but there was a witness, and she says, that car was blue. Okay, so obviously you're sitting there on the jury, the blue taxi cab company is sort of coming into some trouble. But the, the defense sort of says, hey, it was a dark night. The witness could have been wrong. So the prosecution says, hey, we tested our witness. She's pretty accurate under the same conditions. She correctly reports the color of the car 80% of the time. Okay, so that's our scenario. Mull on that. Now, what uh, Tversky and Kahneman asked people in their experiment is which of these statements, A to D, do you think is most likely to be true? So do you agree with the probability that the car was blue is 80%? Do you think, well, maybe it's not quite 80, but it would be, you know, maybe a little bit less than that? Do you think it's 
What do you think is actually more likely the car was green? So let's have a show of hands here. Who is going to pitch for option A? Who's going to pitch for option B? A little bit less than 80, that's quite popular. Who thinks it's about 50 50? Okay, well, who thinks it's more likely that the car was green? Okay, so this audience, you're a bit of a self selecting bias sample for people who are probability geeks, and more of you are right than what Kahneman and Sversky actually found. So the, the right answer is, is option D. It's actually still more likely that the car was green. Now, have you, have you all missed these wonderful probability diagrams from when you were in school? Let's have a look at one more. So basically the, the nub of it is that there's two ways for a witness to see a blue car. Option one is the car was really blue and she's right about it. That's our sort of, I don't know if this has a laser in it. Does, yeah, and it's green even. Okay, so that the, the way this is one way you could have a witness that sees a blue car. The car's really blue, and she correctly identifies it. Chance of that: the base rate of blue taxis times the accuracy of the witness. Expect that to happen about 12% of the time. But there's another way the witness can think the car is blue. It can be really green, and she can be wrong. And 85% times 20% gives us 17. And so if we kind of reweight these things, um, sort of normalise through by, I guess, dividing by 29%, then we, we come out with this probability of 41. And so that, to a lot of people, is really surprising. Maybe fewer people in this room than some audiences, but, um, yeah, Kahneman and Tversky found the vast majority of people went for option A or B. And they dubbed this the base rate fallacy or base rate neglect. And it's the idea that people pay too much attention to the accuracy of the witness bit and kind of forget about the base rate in the population. And you're like, well, okay, what does crazy psychologists from the 1980s have to do with me? Um, well, so a pretty similar thing has been in the news fairly recently. You might have started to see some little scaremongery clickbait articles about, hey, more of the people in hospital are vaccinated than not. Or, hey, more of the people that are dying of COVID are vaccinated than not. Is this scary and terrible, or is it exactly what we would expect, given that 99% of people have had their first dose of a vaccine and 95% of people have had, you know, two doses? So our base rate of vaccinated people is really high. Uh, and so I found this nice picture on, on Twitter, which I, I stole. The, the maker of the figure said he was happy for people to steal it. But it, it basically illustrates this idea. That if you just sort of focus on, now I saw the laser form, form yeah, the hospital, you just think, oh look, more vaccinated people in hospital than unvaccinated, and you forget about the underlying base rate, that this pink circle here of vaccinated people is much bigger, then that's sort of a misleading picture. You have to take into account the base rates when you're thinking about these things. All right, so that's sort of the, the first thing I wanted to talk about. We're going to take a slight change of, of direction here. Um, well, let's get, yeah, it's going to seem like a slight change of direction, but it's going to come back around to being related to what we've just talked about. So I don't know if anyone here recognises either of the people in this, um, this slide here. You maybe don't. So the person up the, the top left is Sally Clark. She was a, a British solicitor. In 1999, she was sent to jail for murdering her two young children, her babies. Um, the guy on the bottom right is Sir Roy Meadow, and he was the person whose expert testimony saw her convicted, basically convinced the jury. His argument ran as follows. He said, if you're a reasonably affluent person and you're a non-smoker, the chance of having a child die of cot death is about one in eight and a half thousand. So the chance of that happening twice is one in 73 million. Therefore, she's guilty, send her to jail. The jury bought that argument. Um, I think of this as maybe one of, probably not the first cases, but a notable case of someone being literally mansplained to death. And that uh, his argument is actually completely, completely wrong. So there are two massive problems with his argument. Problem number one, this innocent looking little multiplication sign. Are we actually allowed to do this multiplication. When are you allowed to multiply two probabilities and get another one? We've got the engineers geeking out at the front saying, you can't do that, man, you can't do that. They love you. Um, 
Yeah, you're not allowed to do that unless events are independent. So if I toss a coin and say, what's the probability of getting ahead? You know, a half. If I do it twice, what's the probability of getting two in a row? A half times a half is a quarter. That's fine, because coin tosses don't affect each other. But if I said to you, okay, I'm going to blindfold you, and I give you some darts, and I want you to throw darts at the calendar, what's the chance that you land on a Saturday? You, my lady, in the front row, what's the chance that if you randomly select a day, it's a Saturday? One in seven. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Next question. I blindfold someone else. You. I'm throw you're throwing darts. What's the chance that you randomly land on a weekend, a Saturday or a Sunday? Two and seven, yes. And so would it be fine for me to say that therefore the probability of it being a Saturday and a weekend is one on seven times two on seven is two on 49? No, that's nonsense. It doesn't make any sense. You can't, you can't just do that multiplication if things aren't independent. It just doesn't work. And when you think about things like cot death, obviously there's all sorts of reasons why they might not be independent. Things like the fact that siblings share half their DNA and there are a lot of genetic reasons that might predispose you to cot death. Um, so that was problem number one. Let's ignore problem number one for the moment. We'll pretend that doesn't exist and say, well, okay, we'll take a big pinch of salt and believe these things are independent. There's still another problem. So what is it that Sir Roy Meadow has calculated there? He's basically said, if she was innocent, the chance of this happening would be one in 73 million. So what he's worked out is the probability of the evidence given that Sally Clark was innocent. Is that likely to be the same as the probability that she's innocent given the evidence? Which, when you think about it, is what you really want to know before you send someone to jail. So an another thing that we tend to do as our thinking heuristics is we tend to sort of think these things should be related and kind of similar to each other. But it doesn't take too much thought to realise that's not necessarily so. Um, I'm going to pick a random person in the audience who owns a dog. Who's, hands up if you have a dog. Okay, this person is going to reveal how many legs their dog has, and I think the probability that it's going to be four is not one, but close to one. How many legs does your dog have? It is four. Yeah, so the probability that a dog, uh, probability that an animal has four legs, given that it's a dog, is pretty high. Whereas on the other hand, if I just say, let's randomly pick someone with a, you know, a pet that has four legs, and then ask them if it's a dog, then that's not the same. It might be a mouse, it might be a guinea pig, it might be a squirrel, it might be a hamster. You know, there's a, so th th those, those probabilities don't have to be the same. Um, and we've seen that already with the earlier example. The probability that the witness thought a car was blue, given it's really blue, that was 80%. But the, the reverse, the probability the car was really blue, given she said it was, that was only about 40%. And the same thing applies here. There's some base rate of people in the population that are homicidal maniacs that are going to kill their children. But we think that that base rate is extraordinarily low, or at least we hope it is. That's probably a tiny, tiny number. And so, whoops, back. Yeah, so, so what we really do is we're trying to balance this way so the tiny chance of having a murderer and then they you know, do kill their children versus the hopefully close to one probability of being a, a non-homicidal parent, that is very unlucky, one in 73 million. And so, yeah, so even ignoring the first mistake, this prosecutor's fallacy is a massive mistake as well. And I like this example because it frightens first years in statistics into realising that sometimes not understanding statistics will have life and death consequences. But I was, I was sort of horrified when I um, looked at the news not that long ago and realised that this exact same story is playing out in Australia with Kathleen Folberg, who's been in jail for about 20 years uh, for the deaths of her four children. Recently, 70 scientists uh, basically um, called on um, her conviction to be overturned. And they even have pretty reasonable evidence for a genetic variant carried by her children that could have, could have explained all the deaths. So, there we go. I don't know if I've lightened the mood or not at all, but uh, <laughs> hopefully you can go away from this talk and realise, yeah, probability is tricky, but we can get over some of our, our poor thinking heuristics if we think about base rates, uh, and yeah, and, and, and don't multiply probabilities when things aren't independent. Yeah, engineers, can I get a hallelujah? Woo!
Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I will. I'm just going to grab a quick mouthful of water. It's a really good question. Did you, did you hear that question? So the question was, if I can repeat it, I quickly explained why Roy Meadow was, was wrong, but why didn't someone at the trial do that? Um, it's, a, it's a really good question because it even, her conviction survived an appeal in the year 2000 where, where, she, where they didn't overturn it, and it wasn't overturned until 2003 when the, like the Royal Statistical Society in the UK wrote a strongly worded letter saying, that's garbage, you just can't do that. Um, and at that point, it caused them to go back and look at a few other historical cases, and they found about three or four women in jail for the exact same reason, and I think basically freed them. Yeah, so, so it prompted a bit of a shake-up. But, it, but it, it is shocking that, like, this isn't difficult. Probability gets way harder than just realising you're not allowed to multiply probabilities of independent events. This isn't even university level. But, like, it's still that the, the defence and the jury couldn't get that concept. It's amazing. I agree. Is there a correlation between stats being in the news and enrolments at university? I don't know. I guess we'd expect a surge in people studying epidemiology if that were the case. So I guess we could we could look for that. But I should caution everyone that, of course, correlation does not imply causation, because otherwise I'd have to rip up my statistician card. You're trying to trap me. <laughs> <laughs> Another question at the front. Is there anyone here from Harris who has a three-legged stool? <laughs> Very fine question. It doesn't appear to be. Okay. My niece has a oh, someone's niece has a three-legged dog. That's good. Okay. <laughs> my, my cat has six legs. Oh, you're an insect lover. Ah, my dog's got two bionic legs. That's cool. Well, knees. Yeah. <laughs> I think we should make this a pet love-in. What do you reckon? <laughs> Pets and probability. Pets and probability. Let's okay. thank Barbara Holland. Thank you. Thank you.